I, I just want to thank thank you for inviting me to come. Uh, thank you to Massimo and, and Jorge and for all the, the work they've done. And I'm just it's just great to come back and hang and talk and gossip and those are all good things that you want to do. Um, and I guess talk linguistics um, and that's really important too, you know. Um, so my my. Re my sort of research program has been always, uh, it, it, well, it hasn't always been, but it sort of moved in this direction of trying to look at this notion of transitivity um, and this notion that some clauses are less transitive than other clauses. And if you, there's a very classic paper by Hopper and Thompson in 1980 where they, they said that transitivity is not something that's all or nothing, that it's on a climb that some clauses can be more transitive and they give you all these criteria. And so my work has been sort of trying to give a more formal characterization of that and I've sort of looked, trying to look at a whole bunch of reduced transitivity clauses as they say. Um, where somehow it looks like the um, semantic patient um, has been somehow withdrawn from the direct object position syntactically. And um, you can often see that because it's, it's no longer case marked with a structural case. It has an accusative case. Uh, it's, it's no, it goes from accusative to maybe an oblique or some sort of instrumental or something like that or a dative. Um, sometimes you'll see in languages that have object agreements, all of a sudden the object agreement will go away. Um, and this often has semantic effects um, like the action is seen as less completive. The, the result is seen as less effective. Um, and so I've been looking, and, and one of the papers that I, that I had sent was some of my work on the anti-passive, which is one of these kinds of reduced transitivity clauses. Um, another kind of reduced transitivity clauses are these clauses where, which, in which it looks like the noun has, object has undergone incorporation. Um, and I give you an example. I don't do field work, because I need to have my orange juice in the morning. And so if I don't get my orange juice, I, I, so, so all of this is from published data. Um, and here's an example from uh, Yucatec Maya. Um, number uh, one, the first example, I chop trees in my cornfield or milpa, um, where you have the unincorporated, you have the verb chop, and then you see tree as a separate morphological unit. But with incorporation, the noun stem and the verb stem merge into one morphological unit. And um, you can see that in the second example. I essentially tree chop in my MOPA. Um, what is interesting about this phenomenon is that not all arguments, or it is said that not all arguments incorporate. That's the conventional wisdom. And then typically it is said that deep subjects, the subjects of unergative verbs, um, they don't incorporate. And the subject of transitive verbs, the agent will not incorporate but direct objects do incorporate. And there's an example in that from Yucatec Maya. Um, and it's not simply the subject because derived subjects, subjects of unaccusative verbs um, incorporate. And I didn't give you that data, but that's, that's sort of the, the received wisdom. wisdom. Um, this subject object asymmetry is seen to result from differing syntactic positions. So way back when you know, Mike and Andy were in graduate school, and <laughs> way back when, Diana too, you know, right? <laughs> I just, and we had like the subject was, uh, you know, uh, dominated by an S node and it was in a specifier position and the object was a complement to the verb. And, and this was seen in through Mark Baker's classic work as a subject-object asymmetry where, where um, you know, and at the time we used notions like government, which are forbidden now, but essentially um, you couldn't incorporate from a specifier position, but you could incorporate from a, from a, from a complement position. And so you get a nice syntactic um, analysis of that. Um, but, you know, recently in some of the work I've done uh, way long time ago, and some of the work, um, now there's a two for objects, um, for, for internal arguments there. Um, and this correlates with this distinction between result verbs and manner verbs of uh, Levine and rappaport hovev And I'm going to give you an example of, of what I think of as, as a result verb, or what is, not, not just me, but, but a result verb like the baby broke the vase. 
And here, syntactically, and I, and I, and I do a distributed morphology approach, um, you have a verb root that acts as a complement to a light verb head. Um, and that creates your VP. And then the vase is in the specifier of a little V head that assigns an undergoer theta role, much like the agent is introduced by a little V that, um, that assigns the agent theta role. So in this case, in this result verb, um, both the baby and the vase are in um, these specifier positions. And this correlates with the fact that, that this is a resultative verb. Um, we don't talk much about what happens to get the vase broken, but it's really talking about the result state of break. Um, that's the main assertion in the, the, of the clause, that the result is part of what is asserted. It's not backgrounded. And furthermore, this has syntactic effects. Putting it in the specifier position, in that position it receives a structural case and there might be agreement. And so that's a typical result verb. Um, for a manner verb, if we look at um, three, the baby ate the cookie, right? Um, a manner verb concentrates as how the action is, is, is going on. Um, the noun phrase here, the cookie, is a typical incremental theme. And that's known by um, Ramshan's work, 2007, as a, as a rheumatic object. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But that um, occurs not in a specifier position, but in a complement position. And I create the verb by adjoining a root to a little v head to create the manner verb. And then that verb that's been created takes the incremental theme object as its complement. And then the baby is added as an agent. So this is a complement position of a manner verb, an incremental theme noun phrase. And then um, with a the result verb, you've got an undergoer noun phrase. It is located in a specifier position. Um, so if this is on the right track, if we really have these two different kinds of verbs, manner and result, um, these two different kinds of objects, a rheumatic object, an incremental theme versus an undergoer object, um, what does that say about incorporation? Um, if we want to assimilate, and one of the things I was trying to do is to assimilate the position, sorry, the syntax of objects and the syntax of subjects and trying to make them as much alike as possible, um, then we would expect that the vase would not incorporate because it's in a specifier position, just like an agent doesn't incorporate because it's in a specifier position. So all other things being equal, if we want to take that very simplistic, and that's nice, right, view that you just, and, and, and you could formalize it, but somehow descriptively um, arguments in specifier positions don't incorporate, then we would not expect result verbs to have, um, to undergo incorporation. Um, but we would expect these manner verbs with these incremental theme objects, they would allow incorporation. And so that would be the, the simplest prediction, that undergoers do not incorporate, but what they're called these rheumatic or these incremental theme objects like the cookie should incorporate. Now the trouble is, is that when you look, it, it, it really seems initially, no, that's not the case. But I think I have some evidence that it might be, or at least this is a good direction to go in, okay? Um, and my evidence is going to come from these sort of four areas. Um, there are some languages which have something called e obligatory noun incorporation. If you looked at the example in one, that noun is either separate or been attached or been incorporated. And that's sort of, quote, optional. But there are some languages in which you cannot find the verb and the object separated. Sometimes that's called denominal verb incorporation. Um, uh, Inuit is, is like that. Um, and I think that's some of the best evidence, at least in those cases, that truly you'll never see in this kind of obligatory incorporation, you never see um, undergoer objects incorporated. So that's one, um, one piece of supporting evidence, which I will get to. Another piece of, of supporting evidence has to do with the meaning change. For these ones in which you have optional incorporation, the incorporated and the unincorporated um, forms often don't have the same meaning. And what it looks like is, is that when they incorporate, the verb has more of a manner, talking about the manner of the action, not really the result. 
while the unincorporated has this possible result reading. Um, and if you look at language after language, it tends to be that way. The incorporated is more manner, the unincorporated is more result. Um, a third is, is this object promotion. Sometimes you'll, you'll see when a, when a noun phrase incorporates, all of a sudden it looks like some other oblique argument, like a location or a possessor. You can all of a sudden assume the direct object position. You can sort of tell by case marking. Um, and what actually happens is, and for a lot of languages, is it's not simply one argument sort of moving into a space um, with this sort of, uh, you know, like an oblique theta role or, or, or a, like a location or possessive theta role and occupying that position syntactically. Semantically, it also looks like it's, it's become an undergoer. It becomes the undergoer argument. And so what I would say there is, is you couldn't have two undergoers in the same clause, so it must mean that the, the noun phrase that's incorporated is not the undergoer. And then finally, causer arguments. Um, I found one language in which it is not possible to have an inanimate cause or argument when you have an incorporated um, noun. Um, an inanimate cause or argument you know, versus an agentive. Um, and so there's a little story about why that would happen, but it supports the idea, again, that um, incorporated forms are not result verbs. If you take the view that cause or arguments require a resultative reading. Okay? And I, I, is everyone clear sort of where we're going? I, I know this is sort of, yeah, okay. Um, so let me go do a little background um, of this distinction between undergoers versus reams or paths. And this comes from Ram Chang, 2007. And I draw heavily from her work. These trees are very similar to what she does, but um, different in, in where she puts the verbal information um, in the sense that, that these, you know, you know, so it doesn't have these undergoers and agentive um, heads, but it's very similar. Um, she says that undergoers are individuated entities um, whose position, state, or motion change is homomorphically related to some path. Either uh, a, a change of a path in space, like moving along, um, a, you know, a path, going along a path in space, or something more metaphoric, like, so if you look at Michael Dried, the coffee beans, the coffee beans is the undergoer here, it's the direct object, and it moves along a scale or a path of dryness, getting more and more and more and more and more dry, so that would be what the path is. Um, and again, you can, the ball rolled is an example of an undergoer. Um, the apple reddened is another example. So these are these derived objects. Um, so, so for her, those occurred in specifier position, but she has a class of objects called, or elements called reams, um, and she says an important subcase paths do not describe elements that are referentially individuated and predicated over within an event typology, but those that actually construct the specific predicational property. So it's the ream, which, which doesn't necessarily have to be a noun phrase. It could be an adjective phrase or a prepositional phrase. Um, it, it plus the verb sort of creates the predicational property. Um, that the subject is asserted to have. And reams and paths are in complement position and can be an NP, adjective phrase, prepositional phrase. Examples of reams in a state of predication. Um, so for Catherine fears nightmares, Catherine is in bed, so the complement to a B verb, the complement to um, a state of verb like fear, or what's called traditionally a subject complement, like Ariel looks tired. Paths are the dynamic counterparts of these reams. Notice those are all state of predications. Paths, um, and they're similar to this notion of a scalar element, which has been, there's been a lot of work on what a scalar element is. And a scalar element is something that sort of measures out the event. It's the path that the events, um, uh, it, it's usually some sort of dimension or some sort of attribute that has ordered values, right? So if you look at, um, th there's basically, according to Levine and Rappaport Hover, three kinds of scales or paths, you have a spatial path, and that's the, that's the most intuitive one. The hikers walked into the woods, and so you have a path from where they started to where they ended, and you sort of move through that path, and the hikers are, are moving through that path. Um, you could have a path based on a property like cleanliness or redness or dryness, and you start at one value, you know, not so dry and or not so clean, and, and it measures out the events to where it finally gets clean. So this is a property scale. Um, the student ate the donut, 
The donut is what's called an extent scale. It's the volume or volume or the spatial extent or the amount of donut, right? And so the event proceeds through the amount of donut. And when the donut's all done, well, the event's all done. Um, and so that's an extent scale. Now, some of these can get lexicalized into verbs, some of these scales. So where, the, where, the, where that information is part of the verb. So in the soup cooled, or the apple reddened, or I dried the beans, um, here you have a property scale that has been lexicalized into the verb. Um, or the balloon rose, you have a spatial path scale going up. That, that path, okay. Um, and extent scales, at least in English, are not lexicalized. But that's what I'm going to argue is, is happening in noun incorporation, is, is for some of these cases, you have an extent scale um, lexicalized. Um, scales can either also be unbounded or bounded. They can have an end point, um, like the soup cooled, and it could just keep cooling. Of course, it, you, know, you can go to absolute zero. Um, the balloon rose, and it can keep rising until it goes out of the universe or whatever. But they all cause it can be bounded and have a definite end point, like empty. Um, and so this will affect some aspects of telicity. And then some people argue that scales can either be multi-valued or, or just um, uh, two-point. So the soup cool, there's multiple kinds of uh, values along coolness that you can measure out. And as the soup is, is going through the event, it's getting cooler and cooler and cooler and cooler and cooler. But for a more punctual verb like the bottle cracked or broke, it's only two points. It moves along the path from not broken to broken. And that would be um, John Beaver's work. Um, and then finally, so these are all kinds of result verbs with this scalar change, moving along a path of ordered uh, values of a certain dimension. Um, you can also have these non-scalar change or these manner verbs like um, screaming, laughing, raining, eating. Um, and and these, are, these would be the manner, classes of manner verbs. Kicking, I kicked the ball, and you were, that would be a manner verb. Um, and, and this definitely does have syntactic effects. Um, one thing you can see in English, um, if you said John painted a picture, a picture there is an incremental theme. It gets created as a result of the action of painting versus John painted a wall. That's more of an undergoer. The wall is undergoing, is becoming, getting a coat of paint. Um, and if you notice, you can't add a benefactive object in the second, or it sounds a little weird, John painted me a wall, but you perfect under the incremental theme, the verb of creation reading. John painted me a picture. Okay. Similarly with carved, you can carve a statue, which is to create a statue by the action of carving. Um, in that case, a statue is an incremental theme being created, so it would be in a complement position. Or you can carve it, you know, you can carve something like carve a stone and just, you know, take stuff off of it, but you're not in the process of creating anything. And that would be more a result for him. And again, you can see Michelangelo carved the Pope a statue, but it's sort of weird to say Michelangelo carved the Pope some stone. Okay, so there's definite syntactic effects. And, and, and this, this, this also tells you that this result manner distinction, um, if you take a constructional view of verb meaning, suggests that like verb roots can be either um, complements to a verbal head and create a result verb, or maybe adjoins to a verbal head and create a manner verb. Um, depending on the meaning of the root, you might, you know, you could get a result or manner. So it's not decided necessarily once and for all. So roots can have multiple positions and, and have these meanings. It's not to say that every root can, can I mean, every root syntactically can occur in both positions, but it doesn't mean every root will support either a manner or result reading. So that's one thing I want to, I think that sort of emphasizes. And again, this also says something about the fact that because the, the A prime and B prime examples are ungrammatical, somehow the undergoer and the benefactive object are competing for something, some case or some position. Um, something's going on there. Um, so, so this is sort of the background. Um, and now I want to get to some reasons why I think that um, undergoes don't incorporate. Um, and I'm going to really try hard, because it's, it's hard to do this and, um, when you start looking at the data. But, but it's these examples from John's work about root incorporation in Inuit, um, which really made me think that this is probably on the right direction and made me think this way. First of all, in Inuit, incorporation is obligatory. 
So here's an example of I am eating dried fish. And you cannot separate out the eating part from the, the dried fish part. They're, they're all one element, as you can see there um, in those examples. Now, notice again, eat as a manner verb. Dried fish would be an extent scale. This shouldn't be a problem. But she goes on to say, an incorporating verb can describe an object coming into being, They're very much an extent scale, just like carve, carve me a, carve a pic, uh, paint a picture or carve a statue, coming into sight, but they cannot describe an object changing from one state to another, which would suggest that you can't get, uh, under this view, when you're changing from one state to another, if you're becoming cool, becoming red, becoming broken, you would be an undergoer and you can't incorporate. Um, so I said, I think that incorporating this insight into the system developed here, we can say that undergoers do not incorporate, um, since undergoer and NPs are elements which change from one state to another. And so if you look at, um, and, and you can look in her 2007 article, if you look there, um, you look at the different kinds of things that, that, that can undergo noun incorporation. You have these extent scales, these creation and consumption verbs, the true incremental themes. So you can eat dried fish, you can drink tea, you can make a parka. These are all kinds of things that um, can incorporate. Um, you can have a property scale. In this case, because I'm focusing on noun incorporation, nominals can, can have a property. So here's something like, um, he became a dentist. So the verb become which is very much in English a subject complement, just like uh, Anne looks tired, um, that can incorporate. Or you can incorporate a path. Um, I'm going to my house. I'm coming from Ottawa. I'm passing through Ottawa. And what's interesting about these ones with a path scale is you have the verb and then you have some prepositional element, and then you have the object of the preposition, which is the incorporated nominal. And what's interesting about these objects of the preposition is they can get um, uh, as I said there, um, they can appear with a with typical nominal inflection. All the other ones cannot, so something's going on there. But still, we don't have the undergoer being incorporated. Um, now, those were cases in which we had dynamic elements, dynamic elements, um, a verb of change. But you have a lot of stative verbs. Um, and again, these stative verbs would be the cases of, of Ramchand's uh, not paths, but rheumatic object, reams. So existentials, um, and, and, and there's tons of these. And like, I have a dog, or there are caribou in Nunavut, or identity, like Sally is a teacher. Um, the, um, things like, the furnace sounds like a ski -doo. I love that sentence. I, I, I talk about that sentence in my syntax class because I said, you know, the whole idea that you, you can understand sentences that you never heard before, and I say, how many of you have ever heard the sentence, the furnace sounds like a ski -doo? And th none of them have, and then I, you know. So it's, I love that sentence. And then I am in Toronto. It's just like the I am in bed one, where in bed was supposed to be a rheumatic, rheumatic object. So John analyzes these obligatory elements as involving a light verb, which is very much like I would, and then, and the light verb may contain certain operators like identity operator, or identity through sight operator, or identity through hearing operator, which gives you that sounds like reading or looks like reading. Um, and then a nominal root, and then a nominal root. So um, that's how she analyzes it. And then she's got more syntax going on um, about, about how the root moves. But, but for this purpose, um, it, again, it looks like that these these things that are basically aromatic or path elements incorporated. Now, if you look more cross-linguistically, and I didn't put a lot of, um, I, I've looked at some of this in, in Salish, and, um, but, but there was an article by Gertz and Marlett, um, and they call this denominal verb formation, and they said if a language has only one denominal affix, the verbal affix that you attach to these obligatorily, comp uh, these obligatorily incorporated nouns, um, it's going to have the meaning like have, do, make, or get. Right? Cross-linguistically, again, we do not see like break and those kinds of things. The next most popular are transitive meanings such as buy and ingest. Um, and then less frequent are intransitive meanings such as go to, but still nothing here. And what I found interesting, especially about verbs like, if you think of verbs like make, get, in a buy, these are all verbs that in English, or these, are the, these concepts are lexicalized by verbs that can occur in the benefactive 
right? And earlier I said that, that when you get a benefactive argument, at least in English, the direct object is going to be an incremental theme. It's going to be one of these dramatic objects. So it's not, again, surprising that we see this cross-linguistically, um, that the same or a very similar set of verbal meanings that can occur in the benefactive are also the similar to the set of things that can undergo this this obligatory noun incorporation. Because I would say that that what they both share is this notion of a of an extent scale or an incremental theme. So that's sort of my and I, I think some of the, the the better evidence that that um, incorporation is really limited to these. Um, um, Ah, extent scales. Okay. A second reading is, is some of the meaning differences between incorporated and non-incorporated forms. That, and, and one of the things that, that when you read the literature about noun incorporation, especially Methuen, they say that, that when a noun incorporates, it often is described like a habitual activity or a culturally important activity or a name-worthy activity. It's not just um, anything that, that, that can incorporate. And for me, when I said when a noun phrase acts as an undergoer, we have a result verb. And in this construction, pragmatically, it's going to be the result of the action that is asserted. What's important pragmatically in this case is that um, when we say the baby broke the vase, is that the, the, concept, the, the assertion is, is the vase is broken at the end of that. Um, we expect then um, that we should see a pragmatic difference between the incorporated and non-incorporated forms, where the non-incorporated forms, um, the unincorporated forms, have a result as part of the assertion. That's going to be really important pragmatically. And in the incorporated forms, either the result is going to be absent, uh, maybe there'll be that kind of change in meaning, or the result is going to be backgrounded. It's not going to be part of the assertion. Um, and so, um, and one of the reasons I as you start looking through this, um, in Yucatec Mayan, okay, 1984, is that he writes that the non-incorporated construction implies, and this has to do with body part, he was talking about body part incorporation, that the body part has been left altered at the end of the action. So that if you look at the difference between 15A with the unincorporated form, uh, actually you may not have 15 because I think my handout is slightly different. Um, but in the A and the A prime examples, between close your eyes and blink, okay? When you close your eyes, that's the, working off that translation, your eyes are in the state of being closed at the end of it. That's the asserted part of that. That's what's important. But if you incorporate it, it doesn't mean close your eyes, it means blink. And notice blink is, is an unargative verb in that way, eyes, eyes closing. Um, um, if you look at B and B prime, um, I stuck out my hand or arm with the unincorporated thing, and, and uh, with the unincorporated form. Um, and he says the body part has been left altered. A hand has been extended. Um, the eyes are squinting. So I stuck my arm, meaning that what's important is that the arm is in a certain position at the end of the event. Um, often he described it as, as, as this was an act of deliberately putting your arm in that position, that that was really important to this. Um, versus if you all of a sudden incorporate it, it means to wave. Again, another manner-like thing. We're not talking about, it's working about this action and activity, not about a result. Um, if you look at the C and the C prime examples, um, it makes you squint, the sun does. And that's the incorporated. And when you're squinting, your eyes are in this kind of funny state. Um, but it's all about the eyes being in that squinting thing versus wink at the girl. And winking is more of a manner. It's much less result-oriented. Um, so um, that's another example. Um, this other one from Chukchi, um, Kozinski, Najalkov, and Polinskaya, right, of the difference between the transitive and incorporated um, and this article that they have is not only about incorporated forms, but also about anti-passive forms. Um, and, and they write that when the direct object is in the canonical, yeah, when the object, well, when you have, when you have an, a noun phrase in the canonical direct object position, they write, the change preservation of the state of the direct object reference is pragmatically relevant. That what they often is, is, if you look at their discussion, is, is that when it's in DO state, the listener's attention 
Uh, when the object occupies the DO position, the listener's attention is drawn to the attained continuing state of the object referent. Again, focusing on that result state. Um, and that's absent pragmatically. It doesn't denotationally they may be the same, but pragmatically you are not drawn to that. And here's one of my favorite examples. Um, screwing up your eyes. The reason why I find that so, such an interesting is that as I was looking through this, I found um, I found how to say that in Chukchi, Koyukon, and Russian. And I don't understand why people talk about screwing up your eyes, but they do. <laughs> and I happen to find those, so, so it's, it's funny. Um, so if you look at the A example versus the other example, the first example is unincorporated. You see eyes has the absolutive case on it, telling you that it's in that structural direct object position. Um, and B is when you incorporate it. Um, so they write that the A examples without incorporation would be appropriate, like some people deny that you can, that's grammatical. You can't because it's emphasizing the change of state in the eyes proper apart from their owner, that the eyes are doing something separate um, and, and, and becoming in this, this funny screwed up state. Um, and so again, we see that difference where, where the, un the, the unincorporated form is, is the listener's attention is drawn to that result state. And then similarly in Koyukon, um, a northern Athabascan language, um, incorporating a non-body part provides an expression denoting acting on the incorporate in the typical manner. So again, this kind of manner reading, the idea that when it incorporates, you get more of a manner reading. So too, incorporation of a body part term expresses the movement of the body part in a typical manner. So, um, and then she also writes, note that the forms with the incorporate express the unmarked situation move body part in typical manner. When the object is an independent noun phrase, the focus is on the deliberate or unusual nature of the action. And so, when you incorporate boat into this um, verb stem that is sort of handle the boat, um, the verb stem is the very last thing in that, in, that, in that example. It just means she launches a boat. It's the typical thing, um, you know, you're just launching the boat. But if you don't incorporate it, it doesn't mean I'm just going to go launch the boat and we're going to go off. It's, it's about deliberately putting the boat in a certain place in the water. Okay. Um, Here's the example of moving her eyes around. I think similar to that, screwing your eyes, uh, screw, 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 um, screwed up his eyes. Um, you can incorporate it and it's fine, but, but most speakers, you cannot, inc you cannot have an unincorporated form um, because that's kind of, it would be weird to, to as associate that. Now, these meaning changes one, and, and so far, especially if you look a lot at, at noun incorporation, I may have to use the board here. Um, I'm cherry picking. <laughs> I'm finding those examples that sort of fit, right? And I'm going to say, am I? And I got, like, worried. Um, because you can find examples of, like, um, kill, break um, in the literature. But one thing that I would have to say is, is in order to um, sort, of, sort of diffuse that, is that oftentimes you do not get a really clear sense of the semantics of the incorporated and unincorporated forms. So first of all, um, maybe that's a problem. Yes, I'm cherry picking. But the other thing is, why does the incorporated form always go from this more result? Non-incorporated always seem in, in language after language, at least these three that I've looked at, focusing on results, whereas when you incorporate, all of a sudden that seems to disappear a little bit. And especially those Maya examples, I think, are really interesting in that way. That's one. Maybe that has to do with just um, having to do with body part terms. Maybe body part terms are special. I don't know. Um, but this is something that's interesting from Chukchi. Um, examples with the stem, and, and I don't want to, I'm, I'm not good at pronunciation, meaning kill reindeer. Um, he says, and, and, and it means kill reindeer, but he, he, he it's with the verb, the verb kill and, and then reindeer, and Kora has been incorporated, can be misleading, as this stem refers to something which in Chukchi culture is a unitary activity and it is exceptionally name-worthy as part of ritual activity in the high points of the day. The verb is translated here as slaughter rather than kill, as this incorporation is lexicalized to the extent that it only refers to reindeer killing in the traditional Chukchi cultural context. Killing of a domestic meat reindeer with a knife in the prescribed manner with all the ritual that goes around it. 
right? So this really isn't like saying, oh my god, the reindeer is dead. Like, I killed the reindeer, and now the reindeer is dead. It means do the reindeer killing, reindeer butchering thing. And, and that's, if, if, I, if I could, <laughs> I try to look at those cases where it looks like, like break and kill and those things in which you have incorporated elements in. And, and I want to, and I think about that beca because of this. Um, um, and this is in um, Salish. And I'm sorry I don't have the Salish examples here because it's something that, that I, I was walking around campus and I was reminded of this. Um, um, you can have a verb like tear, um, like I tore the paper or um, something like that. And that's a regular, this is a, a result verb. When you tear the paper, the paper becomes torn at the end of it. Now, this is an, it isn't, isn't an example with incorporation. And, and, but if you put um, this M suffix after, um, and then you put the paper, the paper all of a sudden, you put a kind of an oblique marker here. Whoops. And this is the anti-passive form. Um, the anti-passive form here, where notice that this is, would typically be in, in the structural case, and now this is in the oblique case. It can go missing. It can't go missing here. But this doesn't mean tear the paper. It means tear off the paper. It means tear off. And if you look at, like, I tore off the paper, what's asserted here is the fact that the paper is off of the pad or something. That's the main focus of the assertion. It's not that the paper is torn. You would not, if you tear off a paper, I mean, yeah, if you do it carefully, it's not going to be torn. There's, there's nothing that's asserted to really be torn here as part of the, it's, it's part of, maybe, maybe the pad is torn, I don't know. But, but here's an example where you have a very high transitivity sentence that gets that result reading, but you lower its transitivity by making the anti-passive. You move this from a structural to an oblique case, and it doesn't mean tear, it means tear off. And this would be a particle verb where someone could argue that the tear is the manner part, and the off is the path. Um, and so this really isn't asserting that the paper is torn. I mean, it's not. But tearing is the action by which you produce the paper or something like that. So that's, that's one example um, of, of perhaps that when you look at these cases with break and tear, uh, or in other examples with incorporation, it might mean something like break off. Um, I don't know. Um, and finally, you can even see things like this. Where, where I think that, that sometimes um, oh, well, let me give you this example in English, like um, using tear, like his toe tore through the sneaker. Right, and here you have the verb tear, but here you have a spatial path scale. And this is really asserting that the toe has gone through that path through the sneaker. And sure, the sneaker is torn, but that may not come to us by the grammar. It may come to us by the logic of the event, that the assertion here is not that the sneaker is torn. The real assertion here is the, the, the toe is through the sneaker. And maybe that the change of state has been backgrounded. Um, and so that's the kind of thing where, and I have to, I have to sort of look more, and the trouble is, is that you don't find uh, enough descriptions, but it is possible that in those cases where it looks like you having an undergo or incorporate, that there may be a meaning change, something along this line, something along the lines of what we see here in Chukchi, that really shows you that, that something else is going on. Um, so that's what I would have to say in that case. Um, Okay. The third reason is that if the semantics should allow it, a verb with the incorporated nominal, right? We have the verb and the nominal. It's the it's the ream. There's no undergoer, so it should be possible to add an undergoer. And this is definitely the case in Inuit. They call these examples possessor raising because it looks like the nominal that has become the direct object. If you look at uh, Nuka removed the skin from the seal. Um, the seal there is an absolutive case, which is the, tr tr uh, the structural case for the direct object. Um, here you have the verb remove, and then skin is, is incorporated. Some people would translate it as nuka remove the seal's 
skin, as though the possessor of, of skin has been raised. But this doesn't really mean the same thing as the, uh, the uh, nuka remove the seal skin. So, because you could just have a seal skin lying around, and someone could take it and put it in the other room. And that is nuka remove the seal skin. This actually means there is a seal, and you are skinning it. Right? And, and notice we have that, that verb in English, to, to skin, remove the skin, to skin something. Um, so there, in this example, the incorporated novel skin is the extent scale. You are measuring out the event through the, through the, the amount of skin. When, when the skin is all off, the action is done. Um, the seal is the undergoer. It's the, it's the element that is changing state. It is becoming removed of its skin. And so the syntax I would have, and I give you a, a sort of a little example here, um, you have the verb, uh, which has this root attached to it. Um, ooh. Uh, that, well, and then you have the VP. And then you have the undergoer element with the noun phrase skin in absolute, um, in, in specifier position. Notice that if you, I think it's on a different page, this is very similar to what I think most people would say if you take a syntactic approach, they would give some version of this where you have some red which is the property scale, and the change of the en, which, which gives the light verb counterpart, which gives the verbal, the verbal head for that. And that's where you have an incorporated property scale, an adjectival. And then my skin reddened, the skin is the thing that undergoes that. This is the exact same thing, only the noun root is something that we translate in English as, as the root is something we translate in English as, an, as a nominal. Um, so the syntax here, this, is, this shouldn't be surprising if you're going to adopt this version that red can incorporate into the verb to get red in, then why can't we get nouns to incorporate into the verb? So this is, this is nothing different. Um, and something that should be expected. Um, this kind of object promotion is also seen in languages which allow this optional incorporation. So you can say, I chop trees in my milpa. And there, milpa, you have the preposition in plus my milpa. And then you can incorporate tree into chop, so you're tree chopping. Um, now, you might say, well, this is a kind of like applicative. And you see in some languages where you incorporate the preposition and then the object of the preposition, like in the, in the Bantu languages, uh, if you look at, at, at Mark Baker's work and some other people, that becomes, that, that gets a, a new syntactic position. But um, uh, Wunderlich writes in that case, though, these two sentences are not synon synonymous. This really means that you've done something. I, I chop trees in my multi. And the first one, without the incorporation, it's just give, in my MOPA is just the location. Um, but in B, you really have what's called the affected object. And you can see that little T marker there, AO, meaning affected object. This really means that the MOPA is undergoing a change of state. Um, and so these aren't identical meaning. So this isn't simply the promotion of an oblique element to some empty syntactic slot. Um, this really is an undergoer um, in a different way. And not surprisingly, this is very, very common with verbs of grooming. Um, uh, he shaved his mustache. Um, here we have mustache that's not incorporated. We have the verb of grooming shave. Um, this could either mean he shaved his own or someone else's mustache. This is a, a transitive one. Now, you can incorporate mustache generating an intransitive form. And now uh, he becomes absolutive because it's an intransitive sentence and the intransitive gets the absolutive case. Um, it means he shaved his own mustache. He shaved. Notice we have that's a reduced transitivity sentence in English. He shaved. There's no object syntactically. Um, then you can add another object, another NP. He, ergative, he absolutive, mustache shaved. And it means he shaved someone else's mustache, where it means that the he in the absolutive case, the someone else, they're undergoing mustache shaving. And again, the mustache is providing the extent scale there. So that's not surprising. Um, and here's another example from a, a language in Brazil. Um, my mother is cutting my child's hair. The first example there is um, the unincorporated form and my offspring um, and then hair. And then you can in incorporate hair uh, and leave offspring there. But it, this still gets the interpretation. My mother is, I, I translated it like literally, my mother is hair cutting my child. My, my, my child is undergoing hair cutting. And again, uh, it's that kind of thing where hair measures out the event. It's an incremental theme in that way. Cutting in this case is, is, is a manner. So, so again, because 
we see cases where you can have other things acting as undergoers and not the incorporated form. Um, it suggests that the incorporated form is not the undergoer, which is what, if we want to have that notion that undergoers don't incorporate. And finally, um, um, there are, there's one language that I found in which inanimate cause or objects, uh, uh, inanimate cause or subjects um, aren't licensed with an incorporated form. Um, so in this case, um, and how am I going to develop this argument? Well, first, uh, Levine and Rappaport at Hovab state that the objects of result verbs cannot go missing. You can't, they can't do under, uh, incremental themes can go missing, but objects of result verbs cannot. So you can't say the baby broke, it's a little weird, um, but you can say the baby ate. And that's because the incremental theme, whatever it is, can go missing. Um, so object completion is, is sometimes used as a diagnostic for manner verbs. Um, and so um, we're going to look at the verb, uh, the language frisian, um, or, right? Um, some verbs allow for object deletion. So in the A example, the child colors the picture. There we have a good old transitive sentence. The picture has not been incorporated into the, in, uh, or deleted. Or you can just say, you know, the child is coloring. And that, that's true in English. Um, uh, this language also allows for object incorporation. And there's a whole, um, this, this Deke 1997 is his dissertation, which tries to argue that, yet, that yes, you do have object incorporation. And you can say the child picture colors, right? He's coloring pictures. Um, what is interesting is that in both the, the object deletion, the detransitivization case, and incorporation case, the subject must be animate and volitional. This is not the case with the transitive, which allows a causative subject. So we can say, you know, the setting sun colors the house, you know, when the sun sets and it casts a little red glow on the house. And that's fine. But you can't do that when you incorporate house. You can't say the setting sun, you know, house colors. Um, similarly, you cannot say um, that with... Um, uh, object deletion. You can't just say the setting sun is coloring. Right? That, and that doesn't work in English as well. Um, what's interesting is that cross-linguistically, cause or subject seem to require a result verb. Um, so if I say something like the sea ate the beach, and this is from Heidi's work with Raffaella, um, the sea ate the beach, it just doesn't work. The sea is an inanimate causer. You can say something like the sea ate away the beach, um, and they analyze that as having a resultative structure. So cause or subjects do not allow incorporation because these subjects require a result verb construction. This is, my, this is the way I would sort of try to explain this data. So incorporation of the object is not possible in a result verb construction. So since the undergoer patient is not in a complement position, when you do incorporate it, you're getting a manner verb. Manner verbs don't allow cause or subjects. Um, so my conclusions, again, suggest a model of syntactic structure in which the innermost verb phrase builds up the predicational element. Um, so you have a light verb and maybe a root adjoined to it to give a manner, or maybe a light verb and a root that's a complement that gives the result, or if you have a light verb and a root adjoined to it, then maybe the complement will be some other phrase like an extent scale or a pro property scale. And then the arguments are all added on top of that in specifier position, just like an, like an agent would under that Kratzerian notion that agents are added by... by um, a little V head. I would say that that's true for undergoers. And if you follow Pil Conan's work, she says that's true for certain applicatives, um, certain uh, indirect objects or applicative, applicative elements. And what's interesting is, and I didn't put it here, um, I, th well, I do have five more minutes, but I, I thought I had like 45 minutes. Um, indirect objects also don't incorporate. So if you hear, in languages, you see something like, I gave the baby a cookie. You cannot incorporate the baby, right? Because it's 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 a it's an applied argument. So if this this is sort of this model is is that you have all these things like agents, benefactives, undergoers. They're the true arguments of the clause. They all have an identical syntax, um, maybe an, a similar in terms of being a little bit backgrounded. And then you have the verb and this stuff occurring as the complement of a verb, a root. Um, a noun phrase, a prepositional phrase, an adjective or whatever, that gives a scale or a rheumatic element that helps build up the predication. Um, and that's it. Thank you. <laughs>